Hey everybody, welcome to the very first episode of Deeper Than Code. I'm so happy to have you here today. Today we're going to be talking about the evolution of the web from Web 1.0 to Web 3.0. We're also going to be covering a lot of other topics that kind of set the stage for the Deeper Than Code podcast and our thesis and what we're trying to deliver to the world. We're going to talk about some formulas that are important for you to understand and where our podcast fits into that formula. We're going to be covering some historical stuff. Um, it's going to be fun. I'm, I'm excited for it. Uh, I'm excited to have you here on this journey. And remember, the podcast is just going to get better and better over time. This is our first one. Give us some grace, but I still think it's going to be great and you are going to love it. So if you're here, thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us on the beginning of this journey. And without further ado, play my theme music. But what if we can make them? Got a app in the world with the participation Looking for representation Don't overlook the payment Silicon Valley was pacing So join the movement We ain't got too much time to be wasting The grind chain We're trying to buy chains The blockchains Digital signatures in exchange Homie, it's not a game Troopers in the VR Trade with homies in DR Currency circulating to stay afloat like a seaport dog Just look at esports Trying to break the walls down They don't want to play fair We gotta shut your doors down Kings and queens learning different things Infiltrate the scene Hey, bye Rapping for the fame, it's a different dream Machine learning and algorithms, that's big business More than just academics, the future's independence Collaboration, no need for elaboration Our thoughts can establish nations, that's not an exaggeration Uh, yeah, opportunity uh, I said it's deeper than cold Since the 80s evolved the digital Ever since the computer invention tech has been pivotal uh, Changing lives, investing in the enterprise yeah. But it's a shame that our efforts get minimized yeah. Black and educated, so y'all can bet I make it Regardless of any disadvantageous legislation Our track record is known for overachieving Leave a window with a crack, we get in and we never leave it uh, We starting conferences, ready to build confidence Running business, our time is Nipsey Hustle was on it It's time to establish dominance We ain't bothered with compliments Should have STEM courses as necessary Every requirements, yeah. Just imagine when the culture get to make decisions, and all the people we can move into bigger positions. The play is power, but man, power is numbers. The strength is in our community, redirecting our hunger, yeah. Okay, we're live. So, welcome everybody. Uh, to the first episode of Deeper Than Code with me, your host, Big Papa Code. And today we're going to be talking about the web's evolution from Web 1.0 to Web 3.0. Um, and before we even dive deep into the concept that we're going to be covering today, I want to make sure I set the stage for what it is we are trying to do with the Deeper Than Code podcast. And essentially what we are trying to do is we have a thesis that we are going to break down in a, another episode in full detail. But to make sure that you understand where we're going and the journey that I want to take everybody on is right now when certain people think of technology topics, they get a little bit, um, it gets a little bit scary. And it just sounds like things that, 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 uh, that are happening to you and around you 
or that maybe you might be participating in, maybe you're not. But the main thing is you may not understand what this has to do with you. There's like a classic uh, business uh, question that that um, is normally asked to people, and uh, when they're trying to sell something, is you know somebody tries to sell you something, and then your response is, "What's in it for me?" With them, what's in it for me? So, what's in it for you with with all these different technologies? And what I want to make sure we understand is there is a there is going to be a catastrophic shift that is happening around us right now. That if you don't take advantage of or if you don't prepare yourself for it's going to happen to you and make you unfortunately obsolete and right now in 2023 you are still um, in the zone where you don't have to um truly embrace that right but as the day as the years go on it's going to be more and more true that you have to understand technology at a deeper level in order to um, to really survive in the world or maybe not survive but really to thrive in the world and one of those things and the kind of the inflection point that I've kind of mapped out is 2032 it's a lot of things that are going to happen in 2032 for example you have the generation X generation the people born from 1965 to 1982 the people right after the um, uh, the people right after the baby boomer generation, and um, and these and these individuals are going to be completely in the zone of starting to retire when 2032 comes. As a matter of fact, the largest group of them from 65 to 67 will all be older. Will all be 65 or older? Um, so those so born in those first three years. Um, and then, ev- and then the rest of the uh, of the group are going to be approaching retirement, thinking about retirement, or coming around to the uh, or, or in the in that general age group. So you have that big move for Generation X. But if Generation X starts retiring, you also have the zone where the entire baby boomer generation has now moved to retirement age. That means everybody born 40, 1946 and 1964. They are all now, as of 2032, will be between the ages of 86 as at the oldest, right, and 68 at the youngest. So even at the um, at the sick at the age 67 for retirement that some people are now seeing instead of 65, you completely have that entire generation completely retired and phased out, and a lot of things are going to happen there. Because a lot of those baby boomers had, let's say, businesses that, um, you know, uh, you know those so those so-called boring businesses, those businesses where they might be, you know, a plumber, they might, uh, you know, have lawn care, they might do this, they might do that, and they have a lot of their Gen Z and um, and Gen Y uh, children and grandchildren don't want to take over those businesses and they're going to be sold to the highest bidders, which are normally going to be a bunch of rich people that are going to seek to automate those businesses and take over that book of business and try to create as little competition for what it is that they're trying to do. And you're going to see more and more of that start to happen. Um, So you're going to have that big shift. You're also going to have the entire Gen Y, Gen Z, and the and the younger Gen Xers, sometimes called Zennials, the people born from seventy seven to eighty two, that those that 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 group from seventy seven and on has never known a world where they didn't have access to the internet in some way during their um, late teen years, and some of them from the day they were born. So you've got the people that were born in 77, 78. What happened to them? They went They went to school. They went to high school. The internet was starting to become a thing. They graduated and they immediately had to start using Microsoft Excel and all this stuff. The dot-com bust happened. This bust happened. This happens. This happens. But they have technology along the way and they watch it grow into what it is. They've never really been an adult without access to this technology. They've never worked in a workforce that wasn't technology-enabled. Then you have the then you have the Gen Ys like myself, 
uh, the millennials. You have them. Um, at that point, they will have um, never known a world um, outside, you know, outside of high school where they didn't have a cell phone in their pocket and access to information and able to call people on a drop of a dime um, and all these different things like that. They won't. They don't know a world without that. Like they grew up in all their formative years with access to this technology. And then you've got, um, after that, you've got Gen Z. And Gen Z's never known a world where they couldn't Google everything immediately. They couldn't TikTok it. They couldn't YouTube it. They, couldn't, they, could, they, they never knew a world where knowledge only came from books or only came from school. They only know a world of free and open communication and knowledge. So this is the world that is going to, to exist. Um, and uh, if you are trying to survive in that world, uh, you have to uh, start now setting yourself up for that future. So if you're an older person, you're a younger person, or, or, or anything in between, uh, you need to have a handle on that. And then some other things that I will attempt to convince you are important, like um, AI singularity, and the 2032 um, Bitcoin happening, which is going to be significant. And all of these other pieces of technology and companies that are building things and where their product roadmaps are. There's a, there is a crazy inflection point coming in 2032. And I cannot stress that enough. If you are not prepared for 2032, um, 2032 is going to smack you in the face. 2032 is is significant time, right? And if you want to thrive in 2032 and beyond, you have to prepare now. These next eight and a half years are going to be important. These next 400 and so weeks are going to be some of the most important uh it's the most important weeks of your entire existence. And if you buckle down and learn and grow during these 400 or so weeks and you prepare yourself accordingly, it will not catch you by surprise. And that is the reason for this podcast. So that this way, 2032 does not sneak up on you. 2032, you are prepared for. 2032, I cannot stop saying that number. And I want you to keep thinking about that number because that year is significant. So with that said, what we're gonna talk about now um, to set the stage, these first few episodes, we're gonna set the stage on some things so that you understand um, what I'm talking about when I talk about things later on in the podcast. I have, I have essentially the first 70 episodes already planned. And these first 10 or so, we're really going to set the stage for things that you need to understand first before you know how to take action. And once we get past these first 10 or 11, everything else we talk about is going to be about how, what you then do um, and, there, and all about action steps. But in order for us to get there, we need to be speaking the same language. So if you are coming from the future and you're able to binge listen to these, um, you'll be able to binge. Make sure you listen to these 10 and then jump to after that, jump to whatever podcast you want, but the uh, whatever episode you want. But these first ten are pivotal. So let's start with um, thinking about Web 1.0, Web and Web 3.0, Web 2.0, all of that. And to start, I'm gonna give you an analogy. So technology always comes in and just makes things easier for in the world, like. That's what technology does. Like right now, I can record myself completely digitally. There's no um, tape recorder, tape recording. There's no, um, you know, there's no eight track player. There's no whatever. You know, I'm a millennial. I don't ever use that stuff anyway. But none of that stuff is happening behind the scenes. This is strictly a digital recording, right? Technology has enhanced this to make it easy for anybody to be able to sit in front of a computer like I'm doing right now and to record themselves and to get it out there into the world, right? That is the world that we live in. Now, um, it, it, and the analogy that I essentially want to use to, to 
make sure this stays in your mind is that's always the purpose of technology. And if you think back to let's give it, let's actually use this example. Let's have a tree, right? Let's say the tree produces apples. So let's say it's an apple tree. And let's say if I walk up to the apple tree, I'm six feet, six foot one, might be shrinking. <laughs> so I might be six foot, but I'm about that tall. And I stand up in front of the apple tree and I start pulling apples down, everything that I can reach, and I put it into a basket. And once I pull down all those apples as much as I can grab, um, there may be apples above, but I can't reach them. So to me, um, there is a lack of apples now. I eat, eat through those apples. I got to wait for now for others that are within my reach to grow back. I, I can only access those apples, right? So in my mind and in the mind of anybody else, like there's a lack of apples, right? But once I invent a piece of technology, right, called a trampoline or even a ladder, right, that allows me to get up higher, then I can get access to all the other apples. And now there's an abundant number of apples again, right? Um, more apples than I can grab, etc., and eat. So there, so that now I've got access to all of those. So the, the the technology example here with the trampoline or with the uh, or with the ladder, right? That's what technology does. Technology allows us to get access to resources we normally wouldn't be able to get access to. It's done that with information. The information was always out there; it was in books, but I can only access a few of them. But then the moment we have Google, we have the internet. I can access any information that's out there, whether it be good information or bad information, at any moment that I want, right? Also, um, when we think about, um, you know, uh, uh, thousands of different new, t uh, new technologies um, that have come out, uh, they, they keep enabling us to access more things than we can could before like for example we have all of this water sometimes we have water shortages and people don't have access to clean water but as soon as you give them access to certain technology they're able to get as much clean water as they want like uh, if we think about now there's all this ocean water that we can't drink so we don't ever really have a lack of water we have a lack of ability to take that ocean water and make it drinkable for us but as soon as we create the technology to do so at scale we will never be able to run out of water there'll be water all the time also, we have these energy shortages and things of that nature, right? And it's difficult and expensive for people to act, to access um, to access uh, um, solar energy. But the amount of solar energy that hits our surface every single year is enough to power way more than we could ever even think of if we're able to create the grid, et cetera, to be able to access that. But it takes investment into the future and for us to stop wanting to burn fossil fuels, et cetera, because there's more than enough energy that just hits the surface every single day even if the, even if we just all just got energy from you know you know the saharan desert we could power america easily with the amount of energy that is received but then you have to create these things you have to do this you have to do that you have to worry about um creating it in a way that's sustainable all these things have to be figured out right because some people say, oh, it's not, it's too difficult to do and blah, blah, blah. But everything that we do now used to be difficult for us at one point. There was always a time when we couldn't do certain things, but now we're able to do it today. And that is the key of uh, understanding that's what technology does for us. And every single time technology comes out, it deep, it displaces and changes the function of jobs. So jobs change function. You, if you were a, um, if you were a, let me think of an old job that we don't do anymore. If you were building cars by hand in the 1900s or you were, uh, you know, taking care of horses or whatever the case may be before there were cars. Eventually what happened is technology came in and displaced your uh, displaced your your livelihood, and there was always times, probably when cars came out, when people were like, "Oh, that horseless carriage, that horseless carriage thing is too expensive." You know, us regular people are still always going to use horses, and then once they got cheaper, 
well, you know, people still like horses. Like, like, that still kept happening, of course. And some people couldn't see the writing on the wall and couldn't see that what, what it, that the thing that they did for a living is going to be displaced, right? People that um, did certain um, um, manufacturing stuff before we had assembly lines, they said, oh, people will never, you know, assembly lines will never be the norm. I'm going to keep doing my thing. I'm not going to worry about all this other stuff that's being created. And we know what happened there, right? And there's dozens and dozens and dozens more examples of exactly that happening, right? Of that exact thing happening of people at some point not um, reading the writing on the wall and seeing that there's a monumental shift. And if I don't adapt to this monumental shift, I will become extinct, right? And that is uh, the inflection point that we are right now because there is about to be a monumental shift that will change the world forever. We are living through it right now. If you just think about the fact that before 2006, 2007, there was no such thing as a social media influencer. The Rock did, wouldn't care about how many people were on his Instagram and on his Twitter. There wouldn't be social media managers. There wouldn't be all these different jobs that have come as a result of this new technology, right? Um, and then you, and, and, and there's so many examples I can go on and on for days about that. But what it all comes down to is you have to prepare for the inevitable change because people want convenience. People want ease. People want a better quality of life. Like the average poor person today lives better than the average rich person in the 1800s because we have had technological advancements that makes life easier for the average everyday person, right? To the point where we can't even um, acknowledge how great things are because we are very focused on things that are bad. And things are bad plenty of places. There are bad things happening, but there's plenty of good. You literally can sit in a seat in the sky and go from one side of the world to the other in a few hours, or one side of the country, I should say, in a few hours, maybe the other side of the world in seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 hours or something, right? You can, you can, without a shadow of a doubt, do that. And that's something that was not possible years and years and years and years and years ago. So... What does that have to do with Web 1.0, Web 2.0, Web 3.0? And really, it has everything to do with that. Um, web 1.0, Web Web 2.0, Web 3.0, um, unless you've been like really entrenched in the web um, from the early 2000s, you, you probably don't even haven't heard those terms a lot. Or maybe you just heard it recently because you've been looking on social media, etc. But what does that really mean? So... Web 1.0, to start with that, and really, like I said, that's one of the foundational things we need to understand before we talk about um, you know, artificial intelligence and we talk about um, machine learning and we talk about prop tech and we talk about all these enhancements that are coming. This is one of those foundational concepts. And if you think back to the 90s, those that are old enough to remember that far back, you know, we had dial-up modems, we had AOL, we had all these different things like that back in the day, and we had the internet. And in order to get on the internet, we had to plug in the phone jack in, 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 you know, into the computer, and that phone jack we plugged into the computer was on the same line as the line for your house. So um, if, unless you were fancy and you had two phone lines for your house, right? And when you uh, and, and when you got on the internet and made those noises, the noises that it made, it would make all those noises, right? And eventually you would get you would come in. The internet would be super slow, but to us it was fast. You'd have you'd go to a page and you know you would 
you'd spin up a page, but the page would just be just kind of read only kind of text and wouldn't be anything crazy happening there because it was just static content. It was one way communication. There was no user generated content. Really, you just read whatever was on the Web pages. And there was no Google and stuff like that back in the day, at least not as advanced as it is now. So the only way I would know about somebody's website is because they told me about it or I saw it on a billboard or on TV or something. Right. But there was a big promise to, you know, what could actually happen. And the people that kind of ran the Internet back then were the webmasters. And, um, you know, I was one of them. And they were the creators on Web 1.0. They were, you know, we were putting together HTML and all these different things like that. And, you know, you wanted a GeoCities website. You wanted your MySpace words to fly across the screen, you know, early on, et cetera. Like, that's the people that you would contact. Another people that would also run and maintain your website, make sure your server stayed up, do all that stuff. All those things that were needed um, fell underneath their purview. But the big thing here is that, there was no e-commerce. I couldn't buy something on the internet, especially not, at least not safely, right? I also could not. Um, I also couldn't. Um, you know, uh, I couldn't find people like I said before, without having prior knowledge of the fact that they existed. Um, and I and there was and there was also no. Um, there, there, there were there was no uh, graph connections between individuals to say that oh your friend like this so maybe you'll like this there was no there was there was no recommendation engines and advertisements and things like that the same way right we had some banner ads and stuff like that maybe a little bit here and there but for the most part it was just pages on the internet and then web 2.0 comes in and this is where all the big businesses start happening where people start to see the value of the web because, you know, and of course the dot-com bust happens, but that's not really important to what we're talking about. So not forgetting that, just not important to our conversation. But Web 2.0 happens. And what Web 2.0 is, is when the big businesses get involved, right? And this is the rise of the blogs, wikis, social media, video sharing, um, and also consumers can both um, can both consume content and they also can contribute to content because of social media, blogging, etc. So there's also heavy centralization. So for so um, as an example, you have a Facebook, and Facebook was one of the big early drivers, uh, you know, of this. Uh, somebody would go ahead and create a page on Facebook, and they can post content whenever they wanted, and their friends could see the content, and millions and millions of people wanted to do that. And where did the business side come in? Well, if you got millions and millions of eyeballs, that means you have millions and millions of opportunities to give somebody data. I mean, to give somebody an ad. And then also, um, the better targeted that ad is, the more profitable the ad is. So that's where they start using your profile data that you put on your page, not really for them to advertise, but really for you to just tell people about yourself and meet new people and do all that stuff. Right, and then they start to sell that data to the highest bidder. Um, you want to you want to talk to twenty people that um, you know uh, that all like the Friday movie. Well, if that's what you want to do, Facebook can go ahead and show your ad to twenty people who have seen the Friday movie. You want to talk to a hundred people that are likely to vote for Barack Obama? You can do it. You can get access to any to you can get your ads in front of the right people. Um, with pinpoint targeting whenever you want. And Google also did the same thing with their advertising, you know, in some ways a lot better and more efficiently than, than uh, Facebook. Because when somebody's on Google looking for something, they all, they might be wanting to buy something depending on the keyword that they put into the search engine. So they put um, a certain keyword into the search engine. People are bidding for um, for placement on people asking for certain um, for certain things because if you ask for certain um, certain things that can um, you know from a psychological standpoint mean that you're primed to buy or pay for information or um, for that thing or pay for the actual thing itself uh, you know if they you say somebody selling a, a you know um, Jordan fours and so somebody types in cheap Jordan 4s 
and you've got Jordan 4s for the cheap, you want to get in front of that person because the first thing they see that's selling Jordan 4s for cheaper than everywhere else is, you know, they're probably going to buy it from you. So that's where we have with Web 2.0. So the, but, but some of the issues we have here are the privacy concerns, et cetera, and the centralization, which is I want to pinpoint on the centralization because a lot of people started to create businesses in this in this environment. And what started to happen here is, for example, if your business runs on Facebook, if Facebook does not like you, they can deplatform you and you can no longer get access to their, you know, to, you know, to their marketplace. It's not a right for you to be on Facebook. Facebook is a private company, not a public utility, right? Now, the internet itself is public, but that website is not. That website belongs to Facebook. You create content on Facebook, Facebook can use it. You create a profile on Facebook, Facebook, you know, gives you access to it. It's this funny thing that, um, you know, that, you know, my parents have said before in the past, um, you know, you know, when you're young and you're like, hey, can I get some allowance? And they'll say back to you, allowance, allowance. Well, here's your allowance. I'm allowing you to live here. I'm allowing you to do this. I'm allowing you. That's what Facebook is doing. They're giving you an allowance. They're allowing you to have your page on their platform. They're allowing you to do this. They're allowing you to do that. They don't have to allow you to do any of those things. Google doesn't have to allow you to advertise to their people either, right? Like there's been plenty of, of situations like the infamous Google slap. If you, if you were around and marketing back in there, I know I'm an OG, so some of you may not remember, you know, Google changing up stuff and thinking Google slapped and, you know, and, you know, backlinking, you know, rules changing and et cetera, et cetera, all these different rules that Google can create at any time and change at any time because it's their prerogative to do so. Whatever's best for their business, their bottom line, for their investors, right, they're going to do and they don't care about you. Right. Um, they care about what is best for their people. Right. Uh, what really what is best for their investors, their um, stakeholders. Um, that's who is important to Google. So. This creates a problem because now the only place people go when they go on the Internet is they go to Facebook. They go to they don't go to individual websites really anymore. Like how often are you going to an individual website that's not a social media website? Now, if you happen to be a little bit older, you may be more likely to go to another website, right? Beside one of the larger websites. But even your smaller websites that might be a smaller community, there's still a centralized hub that you get everything from. You're not going to, you know, um, Joe up the blocks website all the time. But you would go to Joe's Facebook, right? Joe the blog may not even know how to have a website live, right? But he can make a Facebook. But Joe the blog is now putting his entire life in the hands of the owners of these social media companies. And they have immense power. And all that power is centralized into one location. And this is a problem, right? Um, you know, because I know a lot of people don't like capitalism, etc., Whatever, I'm not here to you know tell you all the merits of why capitalism is a good idea, especially if you are a minority, but I won't get into that right now, right? But what we have is we do not have capitalism. Technology destroyed it. We do not have free market capitalism today. It is a lie that we do, and we, uh, we associate a lot of the problems we have with free market capitalism, but we don't actually have it. That's not what we have. We also don't have socialism either. So before anybody jumps for joy, it's like, oh, yeah, socialism. Socialism works, actually. The problem is if you try to mix capitalism and socialism, you get this weird thing that does not work. So you really have to choose, you know, as a country, as a people, which one you want. Because socialism can work really well and capitalism can work really well. Both of them are systems that work, right? What does not work is when you centralize power into the hands of a few. It does not work in a capitalist society when you centralize a bunch of power in the hands of a few billionaires. That is bad. That is not free market capitalism when you do that. 
It's bad in socialism when you do that because the people don't even have any of their own their own ability to fight back truly, right? And if you just give the power to a few oligarchs or whatever the case may be, you now have a problem there too because now those people that have that infinite power will be corrupted infinitely. Um, and that is a problem there as well. And we've seen both of those it's situations play out before and none of them end well so now you have all these large companies with too much ownership of too much you have a you have a completely depleted middle class that does not exist and a lot of that comes from the emergence of web 2.0 now there's a lot of benefit that comes from web 2.0 web 2.0 has a lot of benefits but that centralization evil is a problem, right? And not centralized into having a centralized government. There's great things about having a strong and moral government, right, guided by good principles. But when you don't want a bunch of for-profit companies, you know, lobbying and making decisions and doing this stuff and having the then having at the inside their hands at any moment the entire world's economy because so much of the world's economy runs on e-commerce. Um, and runs on this, runs on that. Like, like think about how many shops um, are dependent upon Amazon. Think about who's dependent on UPS. Think about who's that. Like, there's these just gigantic companies that control everything. And that's not a conspiracy theory. It could sound like that, but the but, but I mean, because I'm not, but I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm just a realist. That is what ha- what's there now. Okay, let's say you want to ship something. All right, you, you if you can't ship it with UPS. You can't ship it with FedEx. You can't ship it with DHL. How are you shipping it? Is there, are there hundreds of small independent groups that you can call at any moment that you have access to that can get your package delivered and there's, and there is a substantial competition for your business all the time? No, there is not. That's a problem, right? Everybody should not be an employee for UPS. There should be hundreds of small businesses of individual people with one truck, one delivery thing, three delivery things, four, five, six. There should be dozens and dozens of small businesses, hundreds of small businesses that can do that. You shouldn't just be synonymous with just saying, I'm going to go to UPS. I'm going to go to this. That is not good, right? Maybe if UPS was a franchise or the UPS store is. Right, but but the entire infrastructure is not. That's something that is an issue, right? And then you have systems like the postal, like the postal service, that is uh, that of course is run by the government. There needs to be more, and that's just an example, right? Of uh, you know, small example that we all know that we can think of. Um, and the only way you can compete with a UPS or a FedEx is to become an Amazon. Because now Amazon doesn't always use UPS or FedEx. They have their own delivery drivers now, right? But they had to become the biggest company in the world to even set foot and try to fight with UPS and FedEx, right? There is not sufficient competition. There is not enough small businesses because small businesses are choked out. And small businesses are the backbone of any um, capitalist society. Everybody needs to do that. And there's plenty of people trying to start a small business, but that small business is dependent upon Amazon Web Services. That small business is dependent upon um, Facebook and Google and Twitter. Like they're dependent upon all of these large, gigantic companies instead of being, you know, um, dependent upon public infrastructure that um, that is free and, uh, you know, uh, not what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Impartial. Right. Where if you are Republican, you could talk. You're a Democrat. You could talk. You're a Libertarian. You could talk. Green Party. You could talk. You're a bad person. You could talk. A good person. You could talk like you can communicate. You can do business. You could do whatever because we need that open communication because our everybody's definition of good, bad, ugly, etc. is not the same. And everybody has that right to, you know, as far as America is concerned, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And that can happen when um, these for-profit companies 
that are subject to you know public opinion and sway are able to deplatform any dissenter at any moment. Um, because now we get into the uh, the thought where at the end of the day, now unless you uh, you take on the viewpoints and thought processes of whatever is uh, considered um, right by whoever decides that, um, unless you do that, um, you can be deplatformed. You can be uh, you know uh, destroyed at any point. So that's what we have in Web 2.0. That is, and that's a problem. There's good parts from it, but like, but like I said, that centralization piece is a critical issue, a critical problem, a a problem that needs to be figured out. And the solution to some of that is Web 3.0, right? And Web 3.0, you can categorize that of, of creating a more intelligent browsing experience. But really, there's a couple of things that are important here. One of the things is uh, the computer isn't going to stop just, uh, is going to have a better understanding of the content that you're looking for, reading for, etc. Also, there's going to be AI, machine learning, natural language processing, etc. as pillars to like help you better interact with the web. And this metaverse stuff, etc. All that is part of it. And all that is, whether you like it or not, is going to happen. Right, it is a hundred percent, and also you have, but also the one of the biggest positives here is decentralization, right? And that's where blockchains, crypto, etc., some of that stuff comes in. But it's not really about that, right? It's not like some people try to make them analogous with each other, and that is true. There, there, there are some there are some things here because ownership and things like that that you need for um, Web 3.0 is best like is best, um, you know, uh, displayed via a blockchain, right? Something like Ethereum, which we'll talk more about later, right? Something like Ethereum can 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 certainly power a decentralized web experience, but it doesn't have to be Ethereum, even though I do think Ethereum probably is the best, um, the, the, the best candidate to help to empower this, especially because of you know the the emergence of layer twos and stuff that we're not going to get into right now, um, but overall, uh, you want that decentralized like that decentralization is important. I want to make sure I don't go too far off on the deep end and I stay focused on what we're talking about here. That's why I'm not hitting on those topics, but I'm definitely covering them in later episodes. So. When we say that things are going to be decentralized, let me just put it this way. Right now, you don't really own your identity online, right? Your identity is scattered across all the social medias and, and, and you know, profiles, etc. that exist all across the Internet, right? But with Web 3.0, you will, you will own your data. You will own your identity and you will have to be compensated for somebody asking for access to it. And let's think about it this way, right? Companies want to sell things to people. Companies want to get access to people that are interested in certain things, and also we as people want to buy stuff. So um, they what, what happens right now is they have to pay Facebook in order to get access to you. You don't get a cut. Well, now, you can make it so that that you can, you know, in this new environment, you can get a cut. They want to pay ten cents per click, or they want to pay for a thousand impressions. You're one of those impressions that happen to see the ad. You take a look at the ad. Do you want it? Do you not want it? Cool. You didn't want it. You still got your ten cents, or whatever that or whatever that might be. That is sounds crazy, but you have to remember. People already paying for this advertising, but the point is they have to go to the person that owns the list. So if you have some, that's why we have newsletter ads. People need to go to the person that has the one million subscribers, and that one million, and they want to put an ad out to that one to the, that group of one million subscribers, right? Well, what if instead of that, those one million, like like I want to get access to that one million subscribers, I pay two hundred dollars to do it, and then now I split the money evenly among the one million subscribers for 
you know, that $200 ad that they saw. So they saw it. They, they, they acted on it or didn't act on it. They opted in. They didn't opt in. They decided they were interested in it. They decided they weren't interested in it. Um, but that but that but that revenue was shared with the end user because they own their identity, so they make money off their identity themselves. Because um, your identity is valuable to somebody. You are somebody's perfect customer for something. You buy stuff every single day, right? That if you like Balenciaga, you're valuable to Balenciaga, right? If you like uh, Cristal, you're valuable to Cristal. If you like Prokeds, you're valuable to Prokeds. You like Hyundai Elantras, you are valuable to Hyundai Elantra. If if somebody makes Hyundai Elantra specific uh, body kits, I don't know who does that, but somebody probably does it. Well, the only people that they care about are people that like Hyundai Elantra, so you are now valuable to them because they need want to get their message in front of as many people like you as possible. Right. And right now, that money goes to those advertisers and they make billions and billions and billions of dollars, not the advertisers, but the but the platforms. And now, with the help of decentralization and blockchain technology, et cetera, the way that entire economy can be changed um, and can work for the um, can work for the general user um, the way that it should. Right. Because uh, we want to empower um, more people to own their identity. Um, and that is, like like I said, one of the big benefits of this. It's going to have, so Web 3.0 is going to have implications for businesses, right? When it comes to advertising, for societies, for individual freedoms, etc. And that is the journey that the web, that the web is taking. The web is moving toward that um, toward that environment. The web is moving toward immersive experiences. The web is moving toward the metaverse. The web is moving toward um, you know uh, blockchains. The web is moving toward that direction. And as the web is moving in that direction, um, if you are, you know, um, let's say you are a person without means, you don't currently have money. Right, so you have your broke. Like one thing that's never going to happen on this podcast. I'm not going to assume that you're wealthy or assume you're poor. I don't know what your situation is, but I do know that you can do a lot. That people tend to underestimate what they can do in five years, and they tend to overestimate what they can do in five months. So you may not be able to change everything about your situation in five months, not get rich quick, etc. But if you ride the right wave, you can come out better. If you have zero dollars now to your name or your living paycheck to paycheck, within nine years, you could easily, you know, be somebody who doesn't live paycheck to paycheck, maybe has ten thousand dollars saved, twenty thousand dollars saved with the right decisions, not financial advice, of course. You also but there's also a chance for you to be become wealthy. There's a chance for you to do this, chance for you to do that. There's all these things. You also could be somebody with means today and be broke tomorrow because you rode the wrong wave, the wave that is disappearing. So if you are a person without means, what do you need to do? Well, you need to identify today where you can fit into this new economy. And what I mean by that is there's going to always be people that need to do work all the time. So in the web 2.0 economy, there are people that were completely broke, but understood social interactions really well, right? Um, and this is before it became like a real mainstream thing. But like in the early 2010s, there was a dude, Ryan Dice and, you know, some other people that really started to champion, hey, there's this new thing. I remember this woman, Kate Buck, you can look her up. Was a, She was a, um, a uh, uh, stay-at-home mom and she needed something she could do from home. And she realized she was good on social media and a bunch of businesses weren't. And she was like, hey, well, if I had their money, I could do A, B, and C for them. And you know what happened? She started doing it. And then when she started doing it, she started making six figures. And she started teaching other people to do it and teaching other people to do it. And then eventually turned into a whole industry. Was she the first one? No. She was one of the first people to start teaching others about this thing that she figured out. Right? And, uh, and you know, she got platformed by Ryan Dice. And Di Ryan Dice blasted her to everybody. 
in the world. So I ended up seeing it. Ryan Dice is a big deal in the web space. If you don't know who that is, um, he's not paying me, so I'm not going to force him on you too hard. <laughs> so, but if you want to, you want to pay him is, you know, 97, 297. He's got a lot of different courses and stuff like that. So if you want to look at any of them, I do say that they, they're pretty good. But um, like I said, he's not paying me. So, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you is that you will get good stuff from it. But, you know, depending on how much money you have, that might be too steep for you. Um, so, but the information is out there. But at the end of the day, the this um, you know that was some that social media marketing agent or social media manager um, you know kind of setup didn't exist until you know you know 2009 2010 2011 when this stuff started to become like oh man this is going to be here to stay and this is changing everything right and so what I'm saying is you need to identify the things that you can do. Let's say you're a person that doesn't have a lot of specialized knowledge, which is one of the important things that you need in order to create a lot of money, right? And I'm gonna actually tell you this formula now. I wasn't planning on, I'm gonna tell you the formula now. And the formula basically goes like this. Matter of fact, I'm gonna draw it on the screen for the people that are actually, uh, people that are here, right? so, and the people that are not seeing them is say it out loud, but the formula goes like this. C plus MM plus SK, right? Boom, boom, times A right and all of that divided by um oh essentially what this is is c stands for character m stands for mindset mastery SK stands for specialized knowledge, A stands for action, and O stands for obstacles, right? And all of that equals results. Now, there's another piece that I I almost am forgetting, and that is also um, access to, um, um, to resources. So, resources that R, and uh, and normally I put that as a little R for resources, right? Essentially what this means is the character that you have, the mindset that you have, and the specialized knowledge you have, which is the most important part of that, right? Because you can have character, have a good mindset, but you don't know crap. You can't do anything with, 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 with a lot of positive mental attitude and no information. You can't do anything with that. But also, you can have all the information you want, but you don't have the right mindset or you're a, and you don't have good character, you won't get very far either. All three of these, adding them together, right? And then along with your action, you can have all this stuff, but not be good at taking action. You can you know, come up with ideas and not do anything with them, right? If you do that, right, uh, have good action and have access to resources, right, you can get results. And all that divided by your obstacles, because there's obstacles that some people have, other people don't have, and obstacles will make all this stuff more difficult, right? Now, you can't always control your obstacles. There's obstacles that you have that other people don't have. You can't control those, and you might as well just realize that, you know, if you have a lot of obstacles, you've got to work twice as hard, right? That's just that's just true, right? But if um, But the thing that you can control the most is you can control... Your mindset easily. You can just you can just change the way that you think um, within a easy easily within ninety days. You can change the entire way that you think. It is very very simple, and there's a lot of scientific proof that you can that you can turn around the way you think fairly simply, right? There's even drugs you can take to do that too, right? If necessary, character that is hard to fix though. 
You can have a good mindset, right? You can be um, a super drug dealer and, um, you know, have a great positive mindset, but bad character, you're okay with selling poison to your people, right? Or any people. So character is important, right? Um, but also character is something that you have or you don't. You know if you're a good person, a good character, you know if you're not, right? You, that, that's, that, but that's something that is hard to, to uh, transform about yourself. But you know if you're a good person already, you need to change the way you think about stuff. On top of changing the way you think, okay, boom, that's the easy part. Well, then now you got to learn something. You can have the best attitude you want. You want to be a nurse? You don't have that. Uh, you, if you don't have the knowledge to be a nurse, you ain't going to be a nurse, right? You're going to have to go get that knowledge, right? Um, your action, that's obvious. You need to have the right hustle. And you can develop that also. And resources, there's resources everywhere. There's time, there's capital everywhere. You can get access to resources, right? Um, either resources in your hand or inside the hand of somebody else if you have the right knowledge. Because, again, the resources don't need to come from you. You just need to learn how to do something. And then somebody that has the resources, just what Kate Buck did. She was completely broke. She knew how to do something other people didn't know how to do. She went to the people with the resources and said, I, I, can, make your, I can make your situation better if you let me do it for you because you have the resources, I have the knowledge. You can get access to resources all the time. Resources are out there right, for you. Um, you would just have to go and get them. But like I said, that character, that mindset, and you have to overcome whatever those obstacles you might have are. The obstacles could be a learning disability. Those obstacles could be where you grew up. Those obstacles can be the color of your skin. Those obstacles can be your sex, your sexual orientation, um, your you know race, whatever. All of these different things can be obstacles. And they might set you backwards, but they can um, but they can but but they can be overcome with enough of what's on, up here on top, right? And only you will know how to, how to balance your formula and make it turn into results for you. So with that said, when we talk about what we're talking about here, what to do next, you need to here develop that specialized knowledge, which is really what this podcast is all about. I'm not going to be here to, to, to motivate you to be to hustle more if you want to be motivated for that. Maybe check out my Instagram. I try to post things about that all the time. That is important. That's not what we're going to talk about here. Maybe because you can watch E.T. the Hip Hop Preacher to help you get that going. Right? Well, Les Brown. You can get that. That's out there for you to get to get the right mindset to have the right hustle. Right? Um, some people get their mindset good, but then still don't take action. Right? But you can read all about that stuff. Right? Um, I can't change your character. Right. That's something that you have to uh, if your character is bad, you have to admit to yourself that's bad and then take um, take action to change your character. Right. Um, and be a person of your word. Be all these different things. You're going to have to improve that for yourself. But this specialized knowledge, that's what I want to help you get. I want to help you know the information because this is what most people are lacking. My people perish for lack of knowledge. You've ever heard that said before. That is true. Yeah, people are perishing because they don't have access to the information. So what should you try? So what you should, you should you do? You should gather that knowledge. You need to, now that you know about what Web 1.0, what Web 2.0 is, what Web 3.0 is, now that you have a basic understanding of that, because you don't have to be an expert at it to know how to take action, now you know enough. You know Web 2.0. You've lived it your whole entire life um, for some of you. And you know um, that somebody can get banned off Facebook at any time. You know that all these websites, even Netflix and all these other websites, are all relying upon Amazon to host their websites for them. So if Amazon decides that they don't want to do that anymore or if something happens to Amazon, half, over half the Internet is going to disappear overnight. Right? There is a lot of problems with, a lot of, with some of that. Right? You now know that information. You know that the world is moving away from that. So what new jobs are going to come 
are going to come out as a result, right? When the gold rush happened, plenty of people made money, right? Um, because they found gold. That happened, right? But some people, the people that made the most money are not the people that went looking for the gold. It was the people selling the picks and the shovels that helped people go ahead and go find gold, right? So you need to figure out how do you enable people to be able to onboard to some of these things? Or how do you, or even if you're not going to um, create those tools, well, then you need to be the best user of the tool, right? Or you need to figure out how you do things that the people that make, because it doesn't have to be the person who owned the company that made the picks and shovels made money. The person that also worked at the front desk at the company that made the picks and the shovels made money. The person that was the accountant for the picks and the shovels made money. The person that was the that that you know that that you know that that uh, you know beat together the sticks and the picks and the shovels and you know molded them together to make the picks and shovels. They all made money. Basically, anybody not only running the company who worked for the company made money off of the gold rush because of that. So there is a gold rush here. Right. And that gold rush comes in with the creator economy. The creator economy is the number one push to get to Web 3.0, because right now creators are always at the whim of Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, canceling, etc. Right. They're at the whim of that. Right. But once we move to Web 3.0, those creators can truly always be themselves. Right. And they can get a larger share of capital. Um, when, when they do deals and things of that nature, they also can own their platforms. They can do this. You already start to see a little bit where certain people like Pat McAfee or this that, and the third um, volume sports and all this stuff that's like not television anymore, but we use for entertainment. You see people owning their platform. When you own your platform, you get more access to, to the, the ability to generate wealth and it becomes very valuable. Um, and these big conglomerates. Uh, you know, end up being less valuable because these smaller upstarts like Mr. Beast, etc., where he's very dependent upon YouTube, but really, honestly, Mr. Beast could just make another thing tomorrow. People will go there, right? Because he because he can control that, right? But you don't. But but in the Web 3.0 world, you don't have to become Mr. Beast to have that type of power, because the world is will change to that way of um, interacting with things to 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 instead of wanting to always hit this centralized point like Facebook, they will be able to freely interact in a world where they can go walk over to here, walk over to there within the metaverse or to do this or do that and interact directly with the creators they want. And those creators can own their content truly. When you build content on the internet right now on Facebook or YouTube, you don't own that content. That content is not yours. That content's owned by the platform you're creating it on. Right now, I'm going to go ahead and take this content. I'm going to put it myself onto these platforms, and I know that they have access to it in a way that, you know, is not preferable to me, but is just the way of the world today, right? But that is changing. So with that changing, what jobs and what um, knowledge bases are going to be more valuable to people. And that piece, you need to get specialized knowledge around it, right? For example, back in the day, um, when um, you know aluminum used to be super expensive, right? And only a few people knew how to take, uh, and the reason why aluminum was expensive, you know there's a lot of aluminum on the world, you may not know this, it used to be a precious metal that everybody wanted. Right. And that's because even though there's a lot of aluminum in the world, it in the wild, aluminum never shows up as as pure metal. It shows up inside this clay format called bauxite. And there is a special process that you use in order to extract right um, aluminum out of um, out, out of bauxite. And only a few people knew how to do that. Right. There's even this old, you know, um, story of this. Um, of this uh, person that goes to this this really really rich king that has a lot of gold and silver and stuff like that, and tells him about this new metal that's even better than all of those, or whatever, and it's aluminum, right? And he tells him that he, that he can extract this from clay at any moment that he wants, and that if you um, you know um, you know 
want, he can make as much for you as possible. But the king saw that as like a problem because he's like, I got all this gold and silver. If people start extracting all this aluminum, it's going to lower the value of what I have. And so they killed the guy and most of his secrets were kind of lost. And that created a whole bunch of mystique and, you know, that might have been the the uh, the source of all the rumors about alchemy or whatever because, of, because, you know, people were trying to make gold and silver or whatever. But really what you could get is you can get aluminum, this silver, beautiful metal, and you can pull it straight out of, um, you can pull it straight out of this clay that's found ubiquitously in the world. And when you extract it, you get this pure um, aluminum metal, right, that you can then do whatever with. And only, like I said, only a few people knew how to do it. And only up until, and I, I don't even know how recent it was, but up until fairly recently, maybe 100 years or so, is when people actually started to be able to um, do it at scale. And now you see aluminum is like throwaway. Like we wrap something up aluminum foil, throw it in the garbage and don't care about it, right? Um, in a way that you never would do with gold or silver, um, but you do with aluminum all the time. But there was a time when aluminum was worth more than gold and silver, right? Or platinum, more... Um, iridium or, or any other type of stuff. It was it was highly, highly valued. And it wasn't because there was, wasn't a lot of it, it's because we didn't have access to it because we didn't know how to pull it out of, you know, um, pull it out of box set. So um, with that said, that's why I want you to have that knowledge. I want you to have the knowledge to take this clay of all these things that are around us that are happening at such a fast speed and be able to extract the aluminum out of it, right? So that you can use that to, um, to not necessarily, if you don't want to be wealthy, you don't have to be wealthy, but to still be competitive and do things because some of these smaller jobs are not going to exist soon, right? So you need to know how to navigate that world. I can't stress that enough. And like I said, these first 10 are foundational, but that's the takeaway here. Figure out the things that Web 3.0 creators are going to need, right? Figure out things that businesses are going to need. Like I've seen um, one great thing that I've seen happening recently is people using um, artificial intelligence to create content and to do this and do that. That is a great place to start if that's something that interests you, right? Because businesses still need content created, and now you have access to AI tools, which means you don't have to be a genius at it. You can just know how to leverage these AI tools, and you can create great, solid content and information for these businesses, and these businesses will pay you in order to do it. And you can charge a great fee because it doesn't take you a long time to do it. So something that doesn't hurt them, because all a business is ever concerned with is that if they give you that, like when I tell people, because I train people on how to be freelancers, a lot of the time, right? And one thing you have to understand as a freelancer is it's not really about your price. It's about what somebody's going to make out of investing in you as a freelancer. So what I mean by that is if you are going to charge $10,000, right, for something, but you're only going to provide them with $10,000 in value, meaning that if they give you $10,000, they're only going to make $10,000 from it. It's not worth them to pay you $10,000, right? If they're gonna if they're gonna give you fifty and you're only gonna make them fifty, it's not worth the fifty. If they if you if something costs cost cost them fifty dollars, but they can make ten thousand dollars off of it, then they've got to flip there. Then it's a good investment for their business, and they want to keep coming back to you to keep making ten thousand. Every time they give you fifty, they make ten thousand. It doesn't have to be such a big discrepancy like that, but every time they give you ten thousand, they make forty thousand. They give you ten. You make 40. I mean, they make 40. They give you 10, they make 40. They give you 10, they make 40. They'll continue to go ahead and that's like the best slot machine in Vegas. You put you put a quarter in and it turns into a dollar. You will play that slot all day because you keep because you keep tripling your money every single time. You're gonna probably put as much money into that machine as possible, you know, because that's something that they want. So you as a as, so 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 you have to think about how you're gonna provide that value. Also, if you're going to be an employee for a company, not even a freelancer, a comp you have to be more valuable to the company than they are to you. Now, 
some people have an issue with that because they don't want to be valuable to other people. And that's why you never really get that far, right? Because if you are like, hey, my I, I, my company pays me fifty thousand, right? Um, and I'm content on literally not providing any value to the company. Well, you'll be the first one to get to get axed because you're not providing the company any value. Um, you have to do something that makes that that makes the company money, or that enables the company to do the other things that make money. Like for example, you could say a receptionist doesn't make the company money, but they do. Because when somebody walks into walks into the walks into the building, the receptionist smiles at them, makes them feel and makes them feel welcome, tells them that tells them that they're important and that they're gonna go tell whoever they're waiting for that this person is here for you and that and that we're gonna get you in contact with the right person, et cetera, et cetera. Like like that receptionist provides a value. The accountant provides a value. They don't directly make you money, but they stop you from doing something illegal that will cost you a lot of money. That's another thing that you can also do. You can provide value, but you stop people from losing lots of money unless they deal with you. Like, hey, you could not use me, but if you don't use me and you do it wrong, and I know how to do it right, but if you do it wrong, you may end up with a $100,000 fine. $2 million fine, $10 million fine, whatever that might be, you can understand, you, you, if you understand those type of things, you can, you can, you, you can provide a service. Um, and like I said, that service can be in the, in the, uh, in line with uh, working for a company, but you have to know something that makes them want to hire you. That's the reason why certain jobs get paid a whole lot more than other jobs. Because at the end of the day, certain jobs require more specialized knowledge. You have to know something that other people don't know um, or something valuable or have a skill that's valuable. All that falls under specialized knowledge. You have to have that skill, that knowledge, that information, right, um, uh, in your mind. So this way that you, um, you know, are valuable to the company or your clients, um, et cetera. And this knowledge that I want to share is that is going to help you develop that specialized knowledge, especially when we start diving deeper into a lot of these topics. So with that said, let's kind of wrap up what we've talked about. So quickly to wrap up, we talked about Web 1.0. That was the original web, right? The wild, wild west before there was any rules, et cetera. And the big thing here is that the web was read-only. People come onto the web, they read things, and there was also no connection. If I didn't know that you existed, I could not find you on the internet. Web 2.0 comes in, comes into fruition, and that's kind of what we have for the most part now. And, and um, there are centralized points where everybody congregates, like Facebook, like YouTube, like Twitter, right? Where everybody congregates, and by going to that location, I can find dozens and dozens and hundreds and hundreds of people, whether I knew they existed or not, right? Um, but the major negative there was the centralization. That centralization means that if Twitter doesn't like you, they can get rid of you. Google doesn't like you, they can get rid of you. YouTube doesn't like you, they can get rid of you, and there's nothing you can do about it, right? That is, um, that is the reality of Web 2.0, right? And then Web 3.0 will allow you the ability to own your space, right? To own your identity, to share in revenue in different and more exciting ways, right? Um, that is the difference between the three and the action steps you need to take is you need to, the same way how people figured out social media management and, and you know, figured out how to use their graphic design skills to make things for people and figured out how to um, build this and build that and connect this. You need to do the same thing for the Web 3.0 world and think about what are those things that people are going to need in the Web 3.0 world. They're still going to need um, designers and things of that nature. They're still going to need people that understand money and finance, there's still going to be people that, um, you know, um, need to create the technology that is that underlies all this stuff that creates the artificial intelligence tools that creates 
um, you know, works with machine learning, that works with blockchains, et cetera, that, that creates all that stuff. And right now, um, it's really easy to learn that information, right? You can learn how to code if you wanted to learn how to code. You can learn tech sales if you want to learn tech sales. You can learn cybersecurity if you want to learn cybersecurity. There's all those tech positions. There's also those positions that aren't necessarily technical, right? Um, but um, and that, that are the result of the enablement of a lot of these things, right? Um, I mean, when you have metaverses, you're going to need tour guys to to tell people how they're supposed to navigate from place to place. There's people that need maybe need to put together guides of how you get from here to here and what places you should avoid. Um, all these different things that can be done that is available to you if you start to see the opportunity, right? If you start to see that people are going to be running to these things and you need and, and you need to equip them when they run to them. So with all that said, that's our first episode. That's definitely going to be the worst episode we've ever done. Each one is going to get better and better. We're going to have um, some guests come on when it's when it's relevant. Um, we're going to have uh, some more detailed talks. We're going to dive deeper into some of these things. Uh, but this first 10 um, podcast is going to be the foundations for everything else that we're going to do. Um, so we're going to cover um, some broader topics before we get really into the nitty gritty. And we're going to really be about getting that specialized knowledge. That's what this all is about, right? This could be stuff that um, I could put together and turn into, um, you know, thousand dollar courses and stuff like that. And, you know, some, some of my friends have told me that I should do that, but I don't want to do that. It's not what I want to do. Because what I want to do is I just want my voice to be heard by as many people as possible and get as many people prepared as possible. And if I only get 50 people that, uh, you know, follow me through all the way through this journey, so be it. If I get 10 people that follow me on this journey, so be it. If I get five that follow me on this journey, so be it. But you won't be able to say that, um, that uh, you know, that I did not try to warn you of all the stuff that's going to happen and that you didn't have to pay a dime to find it out. That it was there, it was available, it was a resource that you had. And um, it's up to you to utilize it. So with that all said and done, um, I'll see you back here next week for those that join me again. Um, for those people